We have an interesting topic at hand. Digital is everywhere and so is uh, the notion of cybersecurity. What would be a good counterintuitive in, uh, insights from you on the way we approach this important topic of cybersecurity? What would be a good counterintuitive in, uh, insights from you on the way we approach this important topic of cybersecurity? Uh, you know, I think that the the world uh, has this, this cybersecurity industry has developed with this idea of a perimeter that has become deperimeterized, and but still a lot of the um, network has gateways. They have things you have to boundaries you have to cross to get into some some protected area, and I think that more and more. The world has to shift to this idea that identity is the perim perimeter. Like the actual individual person, because we are all have mobile devices, we're connecting from everywhere. This has been happening for, for a while, but now with the pandemic and hybrid workforces, it's even more accelerated, right? You have much more remote workforce. And so this idea of uh, sort of the, the walled garden has really been broken. And I think people need to start thinking about really high assurance for the individual that's being authenticated uh, because that there really is no perimeter anymore. And you see things like zero trust, uh, Google's Beyond Corp architecture really is, is shifting the way people think about networks and uh, where the, the locus of, of cyber sec of security needs to be um, placed. But, you know, so taking that forward, right? So. Do you think most of the cybersecurity professionals think in this form or they think in, in, the, in the direction of conventional wisdom, which is there are layers in an organization and there are parameters in all. So there is a gap probably between the way this whole concept is approached by professionals themselves mm -hmm. and with what you're trying to bring out. So where do you think is this going? I mean, where is the gap? And You know, I think, I think in part the... It's, it's becoming recognized whether you want to believe in that or not. Um, I'll tell you why, because when the pandemic uh, hit and everybody started working remotely, uh, there was a huge move to multi-factor authentication and MFA. And that's been a trend that's been happening, but you saw an immediate increase in uh, VPN licenses in the use of MFA. That's what we saw for business continuity and for uh, sort of a reaction. And now, you know, I think that you're starting to see hacks where, like the Uber hack, where hackers are starting to get more sophisticated on MFA. And what we find, what I think is happening is that you don't have, we just did a survey and it's across the board, like cloud applications and SaaS applications have a lot of use of MFA, maybe in the 50 to 60%. And then you've got legacy applications, you've got VPNs and VDI, other ways to get into a network that don't have that much MFA. So you don't have a universal uh, sort of use of this technology, but MFA was a move to higher assurance identity. And so that whether you wanted to or not, I think people are moving that direction. Uh, whether and zero trust is still very nascent in the even though there's a lot of marketing and buzzwords around it it's extremely nascent and I think that those two things will shift the the way CISOs think about security to and identity within that um, but MFA started uh, the thing is that we've got some issues with MFA but uh, but I think that it's it's a good step it's a positive step in, in the direction of authentication so you know taking this a little bit forward so you know we all know about the, 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 the infusion of artificial intelligence in different aspects of digital platforms, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, AI and cybersecurity is a big thing of late, right? So everybody is trying to understand how deep learning or uh, you know, machine learning models can uh, segment threats and can classify threats and detect threats. You know, so when it comes to something like multi-factor authentication or just access, the notion of access, mm -hmm. do you think that there are uh, pieces where uh, artificial intelligence can make this experience seamless because I think where I'm he uh, he heading is when we're designing these cybersecurity uh, uh, components in our platform, we tend to ignore the the user experience altogether. I hate my, I, I, I hate uh, them doing multi-factor authentication, but I know it's a necessary evil, right. and it's so it's a very fragmented experience. Suddenly, I'll get a code and you know, and I have to do things. Where do you think is that the design thinking, the AI, and all this will make uh, th these pieces very seamless for users and they don't have to get paranoid about entering codes and you know. 
numbers or yeah it's, this is a field called behavioral biometrics and we the identity field is definitely working on this uh, it's much more prevalent for consumers and people using mobile devices I mean we've done and I, a company I was with was trying to bring this into the enterprise but we just didn't find enterprises want to pay for AI and identity and they think it's black magic so uh, they just don't understand if it's the risk signals are going to be interpreted well enough and the AI engine is going to make the right decision but when you look on the consumer side you see how people are holding the phone the pressure the typing di uh, dynamics so there's a lot of ways they're doing it it's not perfect it usually uh, you know most You'll, you'll find that most identity is still using rules. So if you log in from LA and then 30 minutes later you're logging in from New York, that can't happen. And uh, that's triggering a high assurance uh, additional factor. So yeah, it's AI um, has unfortunately been less adopted in identity, but there are some places, uh, especially with this idea of adaptive, adaptive multi-factor, where you don't have to, you don't have to uh, present such a, a cumbersome user experience. Yeah. Uh, where, where we're trying to use it. Yeah, because this always got me, you know, we spend, pay so much of attention to design thinking and end user experience, but when it comes to access and security, you know, you, you know, it, it, it compels you to keep doing all these things. So that, I think that's, that's fair. The other important area I see is that whenever we speak about enterprise security or hard name, we always talk about tools. The, the notion of bespoke solutions versus the exponential growth in uh, products and platforms and so where do you think this is headed is it going to be a race between bespoke and tools or uh, because the, each of the products has an endpoint some kind of point to point solution for a particular problem you don't want this entropy big uh, high entropy in having all these as it is organizations have so much of legacy you know components so where do you think this is going bespoke cyber security solutions versus and a tools and product based and a pointed solutions in the ecosystem of an enterprise. Well, this is interesting because even when I was an analyst on Wall Street in uh, 2003, we were calling for the consolidation of security. We, I mean, back then we used to have 20 enterprise would have 20 vendors of security, and they were starting to RSA, ISS, IBM, different acquisitions were happening, and we thought, well, it's going to HP was even a player, or Cisco, that this was going to go into some some big pl pl players. But what we found, even now, 20 years later, is that there's always room for a best of breed plug-in feature solution. And I think that that's just a trend. Um, I do think that there are some poles uh, like SecOps and network security, like a Palo Alto Networks and maybe even cloud security. Some areas are now defined and there are two or three players in those. And those are the players that will acquire others. But um, I think the next level for all of this is even, you know, I don't think it will go down to, to five vendors. You will never have that type of consolidation. So enterprises will be stuck with 40 to 60 bespoke or, you know, point solutions. So how do you get a view of risk when you've got 60 cybersecurity at a global level and cybersecurity is now a board level type of uh, discussion? Right. So, so instead of just looking at your risk at the SecOps level or at the AppSec level or what have you, how do you get a very high level dashboard kind of view the way you do with your financial risk uh, and your capital. And I think that that's, uh, that's the next step for the industry is to figure out a way to, to up-level the view um, of, of cybersecurity in the, industry, in the organization. Yeah, but I think, you know, so do we have people who can even architect such a, such a solution? Because you know, you, you, what you cannot imagine, you cannot construct in, in real life. So imagine having CISOs or uh, senior folks in cybersecurity engineering, if I might say so, having the vision to create a, a unified enterprise level risk from all these different cybersecurity tools and platforms. How does one even envision that? And where does one get trained on this, right? Because as it is, we are struggling for talent. I mean, you can get all kinds of talent, even at the CISO level, right? I mean, there's a CISO who's very uh, business oriented, there's a CISO who's very technical oriented and, and everything in between. So with whatever you just said, where are these kind of people and what training would we need to you know, give them, right? I mean, how, they, how do we get such leaders who can do this? Yeah, I mean, I think the leaders, some CISOs are trying to do this and they're trying to do it with the tools that exist today. Um, but clearly you're not going to solve this problem with people because we have a huge cybersecurity 
gap uh, and talent gap, talent pool uh, dearth in, in the industry. Right. We have over a million jobs of cybersecurity that are open around the world, and this is not getting better. So you're going to have to do it through, uh, well, first of all, just efficiency and automation in your in these stacks that exist. That, and then there's going to have to be some level of coordination uh, between uh, vendors and in some areas like indicators of compromise and and uh, you know built you know uh, shared libraries there has been industry level uh, cooperation to get to this next this holy grail and I'm not sure when but uh, certainly I think some of the startups that are trying to do this now are doing it under using logs and whatever they can do but it would be much better if there were some standards mandated and these company big companies were, were playing with each other to, to give this level of risk view but you know but there is a paradox right if I'm a startup you know the way I'm being pushed by the investment uh, world right is to you know uh, segment your market identify your customers define the product market fit you see there are forces which is telling me as a CEO yeah. of a startup to get very focused on what specific solution and what is my moat around my solution and how I'm going to make sure that this is relevant and yeah. there is zero arbitrage for others. So now, you know, so you see the paradox, right? The the world is driving the, the investment, the, the VCs of the world are driving uh, startup CEOs to think very uh, segmented, very mm -hmm. pointed solutions. And whereas we are talking, you're talking about a continuum where there is a, a folded up view of cybersecurity risk. Uh, so, you know, where are we going? Yeah, that's that's the challenge, right? Because you're right. Uh, VCs, uh, you know, Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, it's all about finding your niche, yeah. being very focused uh, on a category, right. if you can define it. And if you can't, then, uh, you know, part of a category. And then you move out. Right. And not every, and, and that that is, uh, that is becoming less probable for, for new cybersecurity companies because of these big players uh, that established the, the polls. They will buy you. Yeah. Um, and even the, the influence, I think you see Google's influence and, and these uh, you know other companies that, that can attract very high talent and their ability to stop entrepreneurship, Amazon. So um, I think that, uh, you know, that's the challenge. And not only that, but the analysts, the category analysts define and, and really advise a lot of enterprises. And they also look at the world and buying centers. Right. So IT is already structured with certain types of the endpoint team, the network team, the sec. And so if you try to build a solution that doesn't, that crosses some of those, you comp complicate your sales cycle. And it's not clear that you can actually uh, define a new category because the analysts have their existing ones. And, uh, and you know, this is an interesting is point you bring up, right? So. You know, the analysts, I mean, this was a similar thing that happened. I think it happens every time, right? For AI, they said chatbots, you know, and they, you know, rather than conversational AI or something much more grand, grander or more seamless, it, it all boiled down to very many chatbot startups coming up, right? Mm -hmm. And I think similar things that we see in cybersecurity is getting fragmented. But at some point, the enterprise leaders would want uh, integration of what's going on in the company from a cybersecurity standpoint. So. I think this dichotomy is going to stay for now. I don't think we have an easy answer. It's true. But uh, thank you so much. This has been real fun. I mean, this yeah. is a good short burst of cybersecurity early morning. So pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure having you. Appreciate being here. Thank you.